Welcome back to the Blues Brothers podcast, the podcast in which we talk about scaling e-commerce brands from seven to eight figures and building the remarkable teams around them. In this episode, I'm joined by Chris Daly. He has a lot of businesses, so I'm not going to do him justice in introing him, but the one thing I can say is anytime I make a LinkedIn post, he will comment on that LinkedIn post with more value than I can provide it in five. So I'm honored to have him on the podcast and to be able to talk to him. I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot in this discussion. How you doing, Chris? Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, try not to bust your chops too much. <laughs> it's coming. You know it is. <laughs> I know it is. I know it is. Um, firstly, firstly, um, obviously, I love your LinkedIn content, particularly the comments you put on my post, but also the seven posts a day that you put up. Um, I'm learning a lot. Can you introduce yourself and your experience in particularly uh, database marketing? Uh, yeah, so I'm one of the older guys, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Um, I started my career in 1991, so probably before most of you were born, um, and did sales and marketing work for a little while, got my MBA. And it was in that MBA program I got introduced to the importance of data and marketing, um, and I started working on marketing databases. Um, finished my MBA, ended up at a company called Alliance Data here in town. Um, and they happen to be managing the marketing data warehouse for a very, very large um, retail client. They had 85 million consumers, 2 billion SKU item records. Um, and my job was to comb through all that data to help them do all of their campaigns, all of their marketing campaigns. A lot of it was direct mail, some of it was email down the road as we went forward. Um, and we did all the analysis of that too. So we helped them figure out what offer structures they should be using. Uh, we helped them understand the campaigns. They did all the creative work. We did all the segmentation targeting, uh, and then all the ad hoc, uh, the, well, what was that <laughs> type of information? Uh, we also did some modeling of data, response models, spend models. There was some persona modeling going on to help them to figure out how to target and communicate to customers. So, uh, after that, I've spent about 25 years working with retailers. Um, really enjoy the space. It's a fun space. It's an interesting space. It's a difficult space, probably. I don't know. I'm trying to think of a business that's harder than retail, to be honest with you, just because of the inventory aspect that can be really, really tricky. So I uh, love this space. Uh, and I've been working on, uh, I have an agency that does a little bit of work with database marketing. We help people build uh, databases in the cloud so they can analyze their customers. That's where a lot of the stuff comes from. That's why Nathan's going to, he's going to be shooting at me for this one. Um, and then I also have a couple of other small businesses I'm working on right now. So, but one of them is a fun one too. It's about customer generating offers, but we'll get to that later. So. Yeah, yeah, I definitely want to talk about that at some point and the um, the data that you can pull off the back of that. It's a good one. The Where I actually want to start, I want to start on a bit of a contentious topic. I had on two weeks ago the uh, team from Store Hero. And so I'm not sure if you're familiar with Store Hero, but it's a, it's a SaaS product that aggregates data from Shopify. And the primary KPI that they're, they've structured the entire reporting around is contribution margin. And that... The point there being that your average D 2 C online retailer does not have a strong understanding of contribution margin and is indexing too heavily towards gross margin, which typically isn't even calculated correctly and it's leading them astray. And so trying to re-index these uh, D 2 C online retailers towards contribution margin is an effective play and that's why they've built an entire SaaS product around it. I want to pass to you on your thoughts on contribution margin. I, I know we can probably unpack this for the next 10 minutes um, because it's a little bit more nuanced than it seems on the surface. And you know, I, I, yeah, I, so I've talked to the folks at Store Hero before um, and I saw what they're doing and there's, there's a couple thoughts around it. One of the things that I'm hearing a lot of in contribution margin in particular is um, you have to be first order profitable. And, you know, I keep trying to stab that one in the heart. I don't like that idea. Um, and there's a big variety of reasons for that. Um, I don't think contribution margins completely wrong. I think there's variable expenses that can go into that, that you don't really want in contribution margin. And, and I don't think marketing is necessarily responsible for that. So part of it is getting, yeah, the business should focus on it, but marketing, not as much. If you take on too much ownership of products, you'll start looking at, you know, product expenses, et cetera, and not really spending a lot of time on consumers. And so there was a guy who posted this the other day. I think he's going to smack me when he reads that comment that I put on there. 
but he was talking about, you know, contribution margin at a product level. And I'm like, the next time that you go to a bank and you can deposit a product into the bank, you let me know because I'm switching banks, but you can't, you can't, you can't deposit contribution margin into the bank. You can, can you can deposit cash. And so we tend to talk a lot about cash. What cash are you delivering? Um, is it at a level that covers your expenses or not? And then what expenses do you want to include in that? So there's a lot of variability in it. In my mind, um, we've always gone towards what markup have you been maintaining? That's kind of where we cut off. Uh, that includes COGS. So we've got the COGS have been sold in there, but we'll stop at an MMU number and say, here's the goal. Um, and we can set those goals. We could set them at segment levels. We don't ever set a goal to say we want 70% across everybody because we already know that everybody has to do 7% MMU. We, we know that. Um, and so what we do is we try and set the expectations of how do we target people and then have the offers follow the MMU instead of doing things like, you know, here's 20% off. I, I don't care for those. They may hit your contribution margin, but they're going to screw up a few other things in your segmentation. So that's, that's kind of my perspective on it. I, I don't think it's bad. And I do agree with one thing that you said in particular. I don't even realize how many retailers don't know their own metrics. There's a lot of them. And to make you feel good, it's not necessarily small ones either. There are larger retailers where you're like, wow, you don't know that, do you? And so it's a little surprising when you see that. But it's a lot of education that has to go on there, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, do you think there's a, a size of business where contribution margin is going to be more or less relevant? I know there's there's an important on cash and particularly shortening the cash conversion cycle as much as possible, ideally to allow rapid growth. You, you know, I think there is. I think there's, I mean, when you're, I mean, I've had, a, I've had an online retail business before. Uh, I ran it for five years, couldn't make enough money, I had to shut it down. Um, contribution margin was one of the things we looked at, but at the time we were so small, we're trying to grow. So CM wasn't really there. So there is a, there's a point where you're just trying to grow uh, and you're trying to fund that growth too. A lot of these companies that are these small retailers, they're, they're not funding growth from, you know, a VC or a bank or they're funding it themselves and they're funding it from whatever revenues they can generate from their products went out. And so when you look at how segmentation works within a customer portfolio, there are customers who are going to deliver excess cash because they're buying at your selling price. Don't use discounts. They're buying well ahead of your contribution margin target. There are customers who consume a ton of discounts and they're buying well below your CM target. And then there's the people in the middle, right? And as long as you get most of the people to the side, you'll be able to build a decent business. Um, you probably start focusing on it more, I would say around three, $4 million, $5 million. Then you really start focusing on it more. Uh, you're still refining. There's a lot of room to grow too. So it depends on, it depends on the merchant. It depends on what you sell to. If you have a lot of inventory, you know, there's a lot of drop shippers that can hit those numbers. So that's a different type of retail. So it depends on. Yeah. I want to tie back to something you said earlier, which is, um, you're trying to take a stab at anyone with the messaging that you should be profitable on first purchase. Um, I want to dive into that a, a little bit deeper, particularly as it relates to keeping cash conversion cycles short and trying to unlock free cl cash flow to scale rapidly as a startup. Okay, so yeah, so it goes into again, um, and I literally just posted this today, uh, a little earlier today. I was showing new customers that you were acquiring and when you look at the new customers and say, wow, they're sitting at 60% maintained markup is what I use. Um, that seems like a good number overall, the pretty profitable customers, not so bad. Then you just simply apply a quintile model and split them out and say, let's look at the you know top 20% well, of sales, et cetera. And all of a sudden we look at it and go, oh my God, you know, most of that sales came from top quintile one and the people in quintile five were actually not profitable. We lost money, but they moved the most, most number of units. And this is where you go, okay, if I do profit first, I would not have those people. They were 40% of the units that were sold were below your targets. So if you stop trying to go after those people, the economies of scale that you have with your cost of goods sold goes away a little bit because you don't sell those units or you have to find more customers at the very, very top, which is a tricky you know, prospect to do. Um, and that to me is where I'm like, don't, 
don't constrain yourself in there where you say, if you're not profitable, I don't want you because there's a purpose for every customer. And this is what I was writing today. There's a purpose for every customer. Those customers on the bottom do not deliver profits really ever. They usually suck them out, but they move inventory and they move cash and they get cash out of inventory. But right now there are retailers in, in the U S sitting on like $900 billion in retail uh, uh, inventory. Ask Nike, ask Adidas how much inventory they're sitting on right now. They can't get rid of it. Um, and that's what the purpose is for those people. The other people at the top have a purpose of delivering profits and cash and people in the middle do a little bit of both. And so when you understand that, it, it informs your, your offer structure and how you want to go about them. If you sit down and say, I want to do you know, profitable at a certain level for each segment, that might be better um, because there are still going to be people uh, who are going to want discounts. They're just, there are people who just won't shop without a discount. A lot of people think that things are overpriced anyways. Um, and so they're, they're, they're certainly out there. Um, there was a piece of research I read last year that said 90% of Americans look for discounts before they start shopping and 65% are doing it while they're shopping online. So that's probably me going, is there a discount around here? <laughs> You're looking around on the site. So, um, and that to me is that, that don't, don't cage yourself in there's some customers I don't want. You probably want them. You just have to know how to use them. And I think that's the, the big point I'm trying to get to. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense is that you're, you're achieving economies of scale through the volume of that bottom quartile. Not and just, then not just in cost of goods sold in some of your other variable OPEX too, right? Let's say you're ordering boxes and you get boxes for, I don't know, 50 cents a box. Um, that's if you order 5,000 boxes, but if you now only order a thousand, you're going to get them to 50 cents a box and you've increased your expense and now you have to raise your prices. So, it does cycle through. There is an element of customers that I always say you stomach, you kind of almost enjoy them. We, we had a client called the bottom feeders, which I was like, that's not nice. <laughs> <It's> not nice <laughs> um, let's just call them the bargain savvy. And so we call them the bargains that they're very savvy shoppers. I'm going to shop without a deal. And there are times where you just say, I need to get rid of this. It's time to deal. And off they go and they come and take it. And that is their purpose. Um, there are other people that as soon as you list a product, they'll buy it right there, sign and see, no discount needed. And that is their purpose. Understanding that on your file will help you a lot in building a business and scaling quickly. So. Yeah. Would I be fair in saying uh, one of your business's customer generated offers directly ties into this whole line of thinking, which is allow the bottom quartile to request a discount so that we can move more customers in that segment? Yeah. It is. Um, there's a couple of different things that we're trying to do with it. And one of them was um, people are terrible at the offers. Um, like for me, like one of the worst offers you could do is clear. It's where you just send them and say, hey, it's 70% of it. In fact, we went shopping a while ago. I think it was right before the holidays. And I walked past a store that was a well known high end brand for certain apparel. And it was like, take 90% off. And I was like, holy crap, you have 90% off in your window. And I was like, okay, that's different. Everybody sees like this pen. Uh, you know, some people look at this pen and go, hey, it's a cross pen, it's a nice pen. Like, I'd pay $20 for it. Some would say I'd pay a dollar for it. And they're both right. And that's the point, right? They both see different value in the pen and allowing them to assess what value it is and say, can I live with that? Is part of the plan, right? It's part of the the way you go. If you find more people who value twenty bucks, good for you. You're gonna you're gonna make more money. If you find people who value it at you know five bucks, not gonna make as much profit, but you can move more pens, and these people up here become more profitable. So right, that's the deal, and that was part of what customer generated offers is is that people will go to market. They're like, Here, here's twenty percent off. Here's thirty percent off. I I never do those. I don't like them, and the reason why is it says I don't know. Just buy whatever you want, right? And when I have certain targets, um, this is what I think Val, uh, I'm about to tell this one pretty hard, but I, when, he showed, when I showed it to him, was the idea of incremental units, um, where you know if you know the average selling price of an item in a basket, you can calculate thresholds where you increase discounts to have them add an extra item. So you know your basket might be forty nine dollars. In order for you to get the, the discount, you have to spend fifty dollars. But well, the next item is still. Fourteen dollars. So you've now spent you know sixty four dollars to get the extra five dollars in discounts or whatever it is. That incremental unit methodology works very very well. You saw it at Bodyworks. You saw it at Victoria's Secret. You saw it at 
Express. That was us. We were doing all those things. And we did it at a segment level because we knew the bargain savvy. They spent like eight bucks. And we're like, well, listen, if you'll just spend 25, you'll get $10 off. Um, and so they got those and other people got something else. It's that idea in customer generated offers. Let them offer. Um, someone told me that the number of abandoned carts is about $80 billion in the U.S. alone. I believe that's the number. And part of it is they just go, I can't afford that. And so part of what we're trying to see is can we intercept them from losing and say, would you like to make an offer for this to see if we can catch some of those people and see if they'll convert. And we give merchants control. You know, that the number one thing that merchants told us, because we've been wearing this now for two years, um, they said, we need to be able to control this. There are products we can do this on, products we can't do it on. Okay. So now it's down to a product level and a consumer level. But when you think about it, it's buying and selling. It's the haggling that used to be and is prevalent in markets all around the world. It's not online. And so we're 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 really starting to see some interesting results from it. So it's kind of awkward. Yeah, what one interesting idea that I have off the back of that is you could set up a demand curve based on the offers that people are asking for and then relate that to acquisition efforts as to how it would value the product so going back to the pen example if your ads weren't conveying the pen very well or your landing pages weren't conveying the value of the pen people would be asking for 50 percent, 60 percent off offers but if you started to improve your acquisition efforts and made a more compelling case for why the pen is valued at 20 dollars, you should see that average discounting start to raise yep. is that yeah and i, is that and I think that's i think that's part of what we're doing because in our application what we're going to do is over time we're going to apply machine learning to say, here's what the settlement range is for this pen. You have prices from $20 down to $12. This is the range. The median price is here. These customers shop here. We're going to flag them on your Shopify store. These customers shop here. So now you can figure out what offers you want to do going out to them. You don't necessarily have to have them do CGO. You could just make an offer to them, right? So there's ways that what we're doing is collecting information for merchants to say, here's what this customer responds to which will make them more responsive, which is what you're trying to get to. Um, and so we're going to collect that information for them and help them figure that out by scoring their customer files on Shopify. Um, we'll do it on a few other merchants when we get there, but we're not quite there yet. So, um, and from the consumer perspective, there's a utility in it of, um, you know, if you've ever thought of a time that you made a great deal on you bought a car or something, you walked out with like, like a deal there, you feel good. Wouldn't you want your consumers to feel good? And if your consumer felt good shopping with you because they felt like they got a good deal, do you think they're going to come back or go somewhere else? They're trying to come back. Maybe they're going to want to make another offer. And I had retailers ask me, well, what if they get hooked on them? Like manage your offers, manage your margin. You can do that. We give you the tools to do it. So if you have to adjust prices and selling prices because, you know, you stocked out and, you know, you had prices that were too low and you should have raised them up, then you know that information too. The idea is to help merchants sell more help consumers find the deals they want that's the goal so it's like being a broker it's not fun it's very interesting yeah. it's very interesting to watch too because the very first thing people tell you is people are going to ask for like 70 percent off i'm like then you politely decline it what do you mean to decline like it automatically declines for you you set a decline threshold you set a decline if you say they ask for 50 percent off and i can't manage them down to 20 percent, then we'll decline but what we're going to build in 2025 is the counter offer and that's where all the magic is counter offer is super magical because you'll be able to say, this is a new customer. They've asked for 30% off. I'll give them 20% off, but I'll give them 30% off the next transaction of hundred dollars or more in the next 30 days. Boom, pop it out and see what they take. And that is where it will be really, really magical of how do I get that second transaction fast? Cause that's your goal with a new customer. Right. And so figuring those things out, that's, that's part of what we're doing. So it's, it's, it's definitely a lot of the time that I've spent in retail is all kind of business. Yeah, that's ex that's exciting and that's incredible. Um, yeah. Curating the offer around a repeat purchase within a short time period. Yeah, yeah. and it's it, and what ends up happening is you'll see what is your profitability by product. It'll be in your Shopify store on the product page. You'll see the profitability of the, that product. You'll see it on the consumer too, because in the end, the product doesn't generate profits. The consumers do, and if you when you lose track, I told that guy that man. I'm just waiting for him to smack me. Um, <laughs> it was, I was very blunt. Um, you know, I'm sorry that you don't have a product makes money. 
in super steep. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think it's those things. Where if, if we can help merchants survive longer, they, they fail at a very fast rate. If we can help them price and sell better and consumers get what they want, then we're in a great place. Yeah. You might, you might have a biased answer to this question, but how do you recommend the average online econ brand approaches discounting? Um, and let's put customer generated offers aside. Let's, let's just say they, they're running a sale. It's Black Friday. Maybe it's Easter. They have to um, increase revenue for the month because they're down on projections and they have overstock inventory. What is the approach that you would take to discounting and curating the offer? Well, so for me, as a database marketer, everything was the segment. And when I talk about segmentation, some of the campaigns we did, I mean, I remember we did one for Bath and Body Works. There's 6 million people that we were we were sending postcards to six million, um, and we did it three times during the holidays. So it was eighteen million postcards. Um, in that segmentation, you can get into levels of granularity that makes sense. And so, like, you're trying to get people to improve their performance. There are customers that are improving in value on your portfolio. There are customers who are stable year over year. They've spent the same. There are customers who are declining. You know, last year they spent hundred. This year they spent fifty. There are customers who are gone, there are customers who are new, and customers who reactivate. Six portfolios in your business. When you look at each one of them, there are things that you want to do. And the people who are growing, I want them to continue to grow. Do I think I could get more transactions or more units out of them? Probably more units that are transacting at high velocity right now. Um, and so when you when you take those portfolios and you segment them all into quintiles, very simple quintiles, just those, you'll see this huge split of discount utilization, number of times contacted, et cetera. So what you do is you use those tools to say, I'm going to get like two transactions a year out of bargain savvy. It's going to be, you know, summer clearance and holidays. And so, or maybe January clearance and you're like, okay, so this is where I've got to manage those expectations. Can I get an extra transaction during the holidays or can I get it during the summer? And so you try and target those different behaviors. And, and the problem that retailers are going to have is that the vast majority of them don't have the tools to do it. Um, and, you know, I've, I've said this many times to Rick, Rick Watson runs a big uh, talk about Shopify in particular for more than anything else. I'm like, I don't know why they don't deliver marketing data warehouse services to the customers because they would be such better merchants if they had it because the segmentation, the targeting and everything would be much faster. Um, and you could, you know, you could do live RFM scores. Uh, as soon as somebody transacts, you update their score, it's done. Um, we're going to deliver some of that on our platform. Uh, we'll do some of that, some of our paid versions of our platform. There will be uh, response models, stun models, RFM segmentation, all of those things will be uh, flagged in there. But there's also ways for you to, to sort of use discounts to move them into categories, particularly if you have bundles that are in this that are cross category, that, that could be useful. So it really depends on where that customer is in their life stage with you, uh, because some don't stay there forever. And how they're performing now. Can I really get, you know, a bargain savvy person to spend two hundred dollars? Probably not. But if I can get them to spend fifty, I've doubled their value. Okay, so that's the perspective that I take. And that's that's where we talk about unit targeting within transactions. Just add an extra unit. Maybe you get a discount, but that unit takes you above the threshold of fifty, it takes you to sixty. Uh, and I know it's one of the other blog posts up out there. It doesn't cost you ten dollars to give ten bucks. You know that if you if you know anything about markup, you know that most of that ten dollars is just markup, um, and you've already had a seller price in there. That's the other thing that I really spend a lot of time talking about: is use your discounts. If you oh, and by the way, if you aren't putting them into your pricing, you have made a major, major mistake. Put them in your price. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. that was my rate. <laughs> it was a long one, so. No worries at all. I was thinking the the other day that, and I think I was speaking to Val about it, that the Shopify analytics is about 2% of where it should be. Oh, I'm exactly. not sure what the analytics team is doing at Shopify, but they could be providing so much more value to online retailers. So so I, I mean, I just told you, right? I, I worked on a large multi-tenant data warehouse that had 85 million consumers and 2 billion screw item records. They have five times the size of that. Why are you doing something with that? I, I just, it boggles my mind. You could double the revenue from your merchants when they look at it and in one segmented campaign, they could lift customer spend by $60,000 a week, pays for the whole thing. I, it boggles my mind that they haven't figured it out because they have all the data. 
and it's in a multi-tenant environment already. So I'm just like, how have we not figured this part out yet? So, um, you know, there's other interesting things that they're tagging on, but the data is already there. Um, I'm just, I'm surprised that they haven't done it yet because that would have real value, particularly when they go after enterprise and you can give them insights. I mean, I could drop 20 different reports on them that, and one in particular that when they see it, they're like, oh my God. And it's the customer portfolio management that we do. When I show that to people, they're like, how did you do that? It's magic. Um, and so it's simple segmentation. I don't do things that are really super complex. Most of it's pretty simple segmentations. But yeah, Shopify Analytics. Sorry, Shopify. Very good. <laughs> that's the that's same. <laughs> but I don't, yeah. think I don't think any of them took well, to be honest with you. I haven't seen one where I went, damn, that was good. I did see... Before Looker was bought by Google, I actually looked at Looker to embed it into a digital application. That tool was amazing. I was like, you could segment, you could write reports, and you could send those over to Google Analytics as an audience, right from the reporter. I was like, oh, I think it's cool. Um, and that's not what's embedded there now. So it's, that part's gone. But yeah. It was, it was a cool tool. Yeah. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit to, to a bit of a generic question, but a question I think gives us a lot of different directions that we can go from, which is what are the three common mistakes that you find online retailers making? Pricing is number one. I don't, I don't think, I don't think they're doing pricing right. And I, I can, I mean, I can see products and go, that's not priced right. I gotta just look at it. And go, and it's, you know, a lot of them keystone, keystone is where you basically double your cogs and that's your price. Um, you know, there's, there's things that in pricing and most retailers do this, not all. Um, most retailers are IMU pricing, initial markup pricing. Uh, so you have your cost of goods sold. You have the markup that you want on top of the cost of goods sold. Uh, you have discounts that you should be putting in there uh, uh, and allows for discounts and allows for shrink. The stuff that's broken, stuff that's stolen, stuff that's not delivered, you should have an allowance for that and put that in there because somebody's bearing the cost of that to you or to your consumers. Um, and some even put in an allowance for shipping costs. If you're doing free shipping, you should have an allowance for shipping cost in there uh, because so it's 20 years now, shipping is not free, period. It's not free. It's a lie. It's never free. It's baked in. So it's never been free, never going to be free. Um, so if you don't bake those into your pricing, you're off right away. But that's also the markup, right? So imagine having all those things baked in and then you have a consumer who comes up and says, I'm going to pay $20 for this pen. Hey, guess what? All those are baked in there. Your margin's even more higher than what you were anticipating to get it, right? And because you have an allowance for sh free shipping and they didn't take that. So you, right, you made money off of that. You have to put the tools in place in order for you to use the tools. And a lot of them don't do that. So I think that's one of the problems. Um, I don't think they're very good at targeting. Uh, a lot of retailers start, they don't have an audience. They think I'm going to open a store and things are just going to fly off the shelves. And that's not the case. Um, this year, a lot of retailers saw, I mean, I've talked to a lot. They've seen 40 and 50% drop off in, in traffic from the SEO changes this year. And they're just like, oh, that. And and now that uh, retargeting is all but gone uh, from Google, and you're now doing remarketing, retargeting only on social platforms. It'll be Facebook. Uh, I think, I don't know if Pinterest does it or not. Um, and uh, a few others. It, it's going to it's going to constrain the resources. And so you should expect those prices to increase because now you have Google, the big dogs out of that fight. So now, you know, the remarketing on those platforms should go up in price, be my guess. Um, and ads in general are expensive. So I think, you know, a lot of these guys start, they don't have an audience. Um, one of my favorite creators uh, on TikTok, I follow, he actually lives in Ohio. Uh, he created a brand for shorts, athletic shorts. And uh, he's a short dude. So he's got it costs a five nine collector. I think it's five nine, which isn't terribly short. But anyways, um, so he went through during COVID. He sat down and sewed all of his shorts in his mom's basement, <laughs> and he learned how to sew. Taught himself, but he figured out quality. And so while he's doing, it, he's demonstrating quality. Well, that's why his shorts cost forty five fifty bucks, and he, they were all handmade. He sold them out every time he list. Sold them out. Never had to run an ad. Never had to do anything. So if you have an audience before you start, that's helpful. Um, and it should just be your mom, dad, your brothers and sisters and brats. It's not putting the audience. Um, so I think that's one of the other problems. The other thing too, is I think that, um, 
just a lot of them don't understand digital ads. They don't understand email marketing. They really don't understand offer orchestration and, and that type of how to get customers to buy. And the more they learn about that, the better off they'll be. Um, cause a lot of times they panic, um, and they're like, I gotta get money to your point is it's Easter and I've got to sell all this stuff and I'm stuck and I'll do 60% off when you could have done 20% or you could have done targeted offers to different people. Um, and that would have done by it for you. So those are probably the three biggest problems. It's so easy to start an e-commerce store right now. Um, maybe, maybe too easy, uh, because someone posted, I, I echoed it, but I'm not sure if it's right or not, but I've seen it like five times to 90% of these companies fail within 90 days because the, at the end of 90 days, your $1 a month for Shopify is over. And they're like, well, good. So they shut it down. And I'm like, that makes complete sense to me. So I'm waiting for Shopify to say, of those 2.4 million sites, how many is churn every day? So uh, I'm sure there's a big number there that not type. And still, I've seen a statistic, which was the average Shopify store makes $300 in revenue a year and makes a profit of like negative $2,000 a year. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, and it's, a, it's a side hustle that's going backwards. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're the way I thought I was selling, you know, sheep wool shoes didn't really work out. So I don't, it's, yeah. it's bizarre. So yeah. But I, yeah, at least people are thinking about it and it, it's a good experience. I mean, if you could learn from where you failed, it's a good thing. It doesn't cost a ton of money, but you know, you really need to know what you're doing, particularly if you're carrying inventory and you're selling someone else's stuff because you're not going to make the margins on that as much as if you control what you make. Um, there are much bigger margins. You'll see a lot of specialty retailers moving towards that. Uh, Target's private label brands are just off the shelf because they make so much money on them. Um, and you're talking the difference between 25% and 75% in terms of yep. yeah, you definitely want to make that stuff. Find it, source it yourself. Yeah, I, I might be incorrect here, but my understanding is that your experience has been from retailers and then moving into the online space. Is yeah, that- I started with I started with retailers. Um, for how old are you again? <laughs> what was your birthday? Um, probably the four year old Christ in high school. Crap. Uh, it was like the end of nineteen or something. Um, so I, yeah, in two thousand, that's when we built the data warehouse for uh, our clients, and uh, so I spent a lot of time with retail. So it was kind of fun watching e-commerce take off in it from its infancy, seeing the initial pages, uh, sites and just go, wow, that was bad to 2006. I mean, Shopify didn't really pick up ahead of steam until about 2012, maybe, maybe somewhere in there. They've been around for like six years. WooCommerce, I think came in in 2008, nine, somewhere in there. There was another one that was out of South Africa that was doing, it might've been Woo's predecessor, I'm not sure. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting to watch these companies come up at what they're doing and where they're trying to go. Um, it's definitely easier now to do uh, selling online than ever before. Um, and a lot of the things transfer. But I keep telling people too, when you're in some of these retail online spaces, I call it all retail, it's all retail. Um, but it's just different, different channels. You have to consider the physical channel because three quarters of all retail sales are in bricks and mortar. And I think some of these may trend back there. I think apparel may trend back there just because returns are now being priced and you have to pay the shipping and everything else. I think some of these will trend backwards uh, towards retail uh, than than others. Uh, but I think things like beauty care and health and wellness, those things will probably keep growing up. So and there's yeah. a balance. And if you could figure out that balance, that's where all the money is. Uh, the multi-channel ones seem to do the best. Um, yeah, so, so that was a question that I had for you is if you're an online only direct to consumer brand, at what point should you be considering moving your product into retailers? Yeah, you know, and if you're doing if you're doing CPG in the direct space too, that gets it gets tricky because now you're talking slotting fees. You talk, there's a lot there when you're in someone else's real estate. Um what I would suggest to you is to 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 look at selling some of your products through similar websites. So there may be similar e-commerce sites where you can sell those products and white label them if you can. That, to me, I don't think people have figured out the white label the piece where, you know, I'm making this pen says cross and tomorrow it says daily. Hey, we've got daily pens. Ooh, they're $25. Um, you know, like you can white label stuff if you, you have that capability. 
And now you could sell it through other leading websites and it's a different product that's the same stuff. It gives you economies of scale in manufacturing and SKUs, and that's what you're looking for to help your DTC business as well. So you have to think a little bit about what those distribution channels look like. You may have your own physical store. I believe if you're over a million dollars, you should probably have your own physical store anyways, just a place to people could see it um, and go and take away their goods um, and or clear stuff out. We have a concept that we were building. I worked for a company called uh, Frankgate, and we were talking about building retail stores, and everything was catalog and e-commerce for them. And you know, we went round and round and round about. It. I'm like, why don't we just build a house? And they're like, what? And like, well, most of the houses we showcase are multi-million dollar homes, so why don't we just build a million dollar home or stuff it, so people could come and sit on it and experience it and see it? That's very Frankgate. <laughs> they looked at me and I'm like, it's not a bad idea though. So they're like, no, it's about a million dollars for a build out. So I'm like. Yeah. So, uh, did they do it? No, they're still building stores, but it's, it's, it's interesting to me that the things that you can do in retail, you should definitely think about multiple channels. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yep. With pricing, one of the common mistakes that you mentioned earlier, a bit of pushback that I would have being within the silo of Google and Facebook ads and being on paid media acquisition would be that if you have a relatively commoditized product, Google shopping ends up tending itself towards being incredibly price sensitive. And so if majority of retailers out there or your competition are pricing incorrectly, they're going, okay, here's our cogs, double it, sell without including all of the different layers that you recommended. And then you come to market and you're priced 20% above all the competitors. How would you approach that? Would you recommend cutting your pricing back to the, the competitive landscape and where they've set the average price or? So I would say no. Um, so there's always a difference between them. Um, the people who know to put their pricing together the right way also usually have the best service too. They know how to serve customers. People who are just sort of, you know, let's go double my cost and just throw it out there are just throwing things against the wall. And they're selling a bunch of other people's stuff and that's fine. Um, I, and a great example, one of the products I sold, this is so funny. It was this little bunny rabbit. <laughs> I don't know why I had, I had statues and figurines. My business was about working from home. Uh, it was maybe a little bit too early before people did work from home, but it was really for people in sales who traveled a lot and worked from home. Uh, and, and I realized they didn't live in a cube. They didn't work in a the cube. They worked in a nice office, all sorts of pictures and stuff. Yeah. All these personal things. Right. And so I was like, let's, let's do that. Let's. Let's create a nice space. So I was selling these little cast iron bunny rabbits and I got them from, it was a cool vendor. I really liked them all. They had some good stuff. Um, and I sold thousands of these things. I was like, holy cow. Um, I started with them. I think I keystone them when I first started. I was like, ah, oh, that's just, we'll see what happens. And at like $10, they were gone. I think my cost was two bucks a piece or something like that. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'm going to raise this. And I kept raising the price to where I was like $25. I'm still selling the same little bunny rabbit. I'm like, okay, there were other people out there who were at $10, but I was still selling a bunch of them because in part, I was also saying, hey, we sold X number of units, right? We, we sold more or all right, this is our customer guarantee. And I, I saw this the other day, Frontgate had it actually. And it was one of the people that I was looking for to see if they had this. They put in their, I was looking for luxury outdoor furniture and it said, we have a five-year manufacturer guarantee on our products. Which one are you clicking on? The one who's cheaper or the one that just said it's guaranteed? Yeah, you know which one you're guaranteed. All right, if I'm going to spend $2,500 on an outdoor couch, it better be guaranteed. Um, and so there's ways for you to do that. Don't necessarily sit there and go, I'm going to, I'm going to eat that uh, that margin. Don't do it. Um, it's, a, it's a trip to the bottom and you're not going to win. Plus, yep. plus, this is the other big thing. Customers that they have in their portfolio are different than the ones you have in yours. They are not the same, even if they're buying the same product. Remember, I told you there are people in here who will pay five dollars for this and twenty dollars. You have them in your portfolio too. If you only go to the people who spend five, you'll only collect the people who spend five. Don't do that. Leave it alone. You might not want to advertise that product. That's up to you. Figure it out. Yeah, the only thing you posted something um, a couple weeks ago about. Um, suppression files and uh i was like yeah that, yeah i think it was i'm pretty sure it's you um and you talked about putting a suppression file in into uh, facebook so that you weren't basically targeting people that are already buying from you and that's one of the things about database marketing right? we created suppression files all the time 
and you could suppress at a very granular level an audience that says, hey, all these people bought this pen. They don't need another pen. They need refills. So don't sell them the pen, sell them the refills. Uh, and, and you can change your ads that way. Make them more efficient. It's one of the reasons why they need those those tools because Shopify is not going to do it from the cart. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And particularly because Google and Facebook will always prioritize attributing themselves as many purchases as possible because their incentive is get advertisers to spend as much as they can possibly spend with us. Um, and yeah. so and so you can you need to take in platform results in platform data with a grain of salt and through the lens that these platforms are trying to convince you to spend more and know that that's how the data is being presented to you. Well, and, and there's a, I mean, there's a good thing about the Google and Facebook platforms is that when they convert, you get the customer and you can remarket to them versus the marketplaces where you go to Amazon or eBay and you're not the merchant of record. The merchant of record is whoever does the transaction and it is them. And so you don't get a remarket to them. So when you think about a customer that spent $200 with you through a marketplace and you can't send them an email or market to them at all, that's expensive. And when they do it twice and you pay that fee twice or three times or four times, then you're realizing marketplaces aren't necessarily a good deal either. And so you've got to be really careful and watch what you're doing in those. I know one reach out to 25% of the business is from Amazon. And I mean, they're paying to reacquire customers every day. I'm like, that sucks. You have got to get control of that customer relationship or your cost to serve them is always going to be high. And uh, you're never going to, you're going to have a CAC that's going to look just ridiculous. <laughs> it's going to be very, very high number. So yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. So that's interesting. What would your recommendation be for, um, online only brands who have 40 to 50% of their revenue coming from marketplaces? Because we have a few clients where that's the case. And we recommend exactly what you're saying, which is that, yes, the cost may be similar in terms of you're paying that 20% Facebook cost or the 20% Google cost of your total price, um, but you're gathering first-party data and potentially zero-party data as well if you have your collection points. Right, right. So, and it's like, you lose all that. You lose all of that. And it's, it's yeah, I, I mean... And this is, I'll be honest with you, it was one of the ideas behind customer generated offers. Uh, my wife and I, my wife works for a retailer, and she was telling me about their costs. And I was like, holy, really? And she goes, yeah, that's really high. And I was like, what if they just came and made an offer to you on your site instead of on Amazon? I'm like, oh, you can't do that. Amazon wouldn't like it. I'm like, well, you can't do that, but customer generated offers could. So I'm like, I could certainly swipe people off those platforms and move them right over. That's not, that's not a digital difficulty at all. And, uh, she goes, really? I'm like, oh yeah, that's easy. Um, and so, <laughs> so that's part of the impetus of customer generated offers is you get the customer. Um, and I, you know, this is one of the things about it is we're building this platform. Um, one of the things that we've heard and, and we're, it's interesting in the B2B SaaS and the B2B seeks we're B2B to C, um, retailers hate those. They hate percentage because it's, 3% on our transactions for processing payments. It's 2% for this and 5% for this. And all of a sudden they're sitting at 25%. They're like, how am I going to get to attribution margin? I just gave it all away to just get into the market. And I think they don't like that. Um, they like they don't like the marketplaces. They don't like taking percentages. They'd rather have flat fees that they can amortize it up. So that's part of what we're doing. Um, we'll probably end up charging a percentage when you acquire a new customer. But after that, you do whatever you want um, and off you go. So. Uh, we're going to try and get the flat prices there. So that's, to me, it's it's those things that eat at those merchant margins so fast. And you have them on marketplaces. Yeah, you're getting good quality customers, but you have to pay to get them multiple times. Um, so yeah, it's kind of losing out. And it's it's really hard. I mean, you can't remarket to them. You do have the data. I mean, it does end up in your data warehouse. So I'm just, I'm just saying it's part of an audience. You're not really marketing to them. You're just learning about them. So there's ways you can use it, but yeah, it's tricky. And I'm waiting to see if that lasts because I know that Amazon's got some uh, uh, litigation coming in some about being forced to put the uh, lowest price on the Amazon or something like that. I think there's litigation of it from the FTC. Mm. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts. Retail. I mean, I was joking about this the other day that. You know, in 2000, you know, you go to retail, you had a spreadsheet and you had a couple of things that you sold. And today your tech stack is like this log. It looks like a CVS receipt. You're like, holy cow. 
Um, we have so much tech to do things. And a lot of the tech is, and this is why I think people like Shopify. A lot of the tech is to do one thing. And so when you go to Shopify, you can turn on Google ads, you can turn on Facebook ads, you can turn on Amazon, you can turn on ads. You, t- you don't have to plug all this crap in. Um, and I think they'd like that a lot. Uh, so we'll see. But yeah, from, from a merchant perspective, if you're on those marketplaces, you've got to find a way to kind of get them back to you or you're going to spend a lot of money that's going to make it very hard to make money off of them. So, so yeah. Tricky, right? What, it's, one, it's, yeah, what one interesting idea that uh, John Moran said from Solutions Aid, which is a Google Ads agency based over there in the US, is if you're going to retail on Amazon, eBay, any of them, but particularly Amazon, what the big tech platforms do, which is really annoying for us as an acquisition agency, is they'll now serve all those products onto Google Shopping and onto Google Search Ads. Yes. And so what ends up happening is if you're generating all of this demand for your brand across Facebook, across, let's say, TikTok, across retailers, and then they're they serve for your brand, they pathway through Amazon. And they're always going to prefer to buy from Amazon because there's guaranteed returns, the shipping's faster, and it, it's a platform that they're used to. They probably have Amazon Prime as well, so they're going to get the benefits there in terms of shipping costs. And now you not only lose the 30% that you paid to get that customer to search for your brand, but you lose another 30% that Amazon takes from you and you don't even get the first party data in the first place. Exactly. I mean, you were just kidding. And, and then on top of that, they're, they're driving the cost of your ads up. And then you're just like, I spent all this time and money on this and you took it from me. And it's like, ah. Yeah, I, I just look at them like there's amazing things that they do from a consumer perspective. How do you meet or beat that? Because if you meet it, I don't think you're going to get them away. But if you can beat that, you will. And there's a reason why I don't think you see a ton of, you know, I mean, I think Frank Gate does sell on Amazon now, but they did it for a long time. They were so exclusive because it was a luxury brand. And they were like, we don't care if, you know, people at the volunteer, we don't want them shopping here because we're not marking down a $2,500 outdoor sofa. And I'm like, um, and so it, and that worked for them. But as you move towards that space, it's hard to get off of that space when they have all the data. Um, and so that'll be interesting to see because one of the things that everybody said that Shopify should do is create a market. Uh, you have all the data. Why don't you do it? Just open up one of your own stores and just stick it everywhere in it. You've got multi-tenant. You can figure it out. You go. And so they're like, well, we're not doing that. Like, liar. You know, <laughs> you connected to Amazon and you don't want to irritate them. But, you know, you were doing it a little bit with Google Shopping uh, for a while and that ended. So I see more of these happening. But for me, it's the consumer utility. And that is the big part of what we're doing with the customer generating offers is what is the utility for the consumer? One, their ability to make a good deal for themselves. Uh, two, the ability to control their information. Um, and three, uh, the ability to find merchants that they like and not have to go to the same places all the time uh, and to get the best service possible. So we're trying to find utility for them as well. Um, we told I told a VC that we were the PayPal of customer-generated offers. And they're like, you know, I think I understand what that is. I'm like, okay, good. So yeah, it's if you can figure those things out, then then you're in a good space. And Amazon figured it out. Um, Costco kind of figures it out with their program, but yeah, it's weird and it's hard. I mean, if you're a merchant, once you're stuck on it, it's very hard to get off. Um, yeah, yep. I, there's not easy yeah. solutions, and it's and you could spend a bunch of money marketing for that, which is very very frustrating. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sarah is I mean, it's terrible, right? I should laugh, but it's. Um, while we're on the on the marketplace topic, I've got one follow up question, which is I've heard a lot of, you could call them thought leaders in the space, say that in ten to twenty years websites won't exist anymore, and that because of the big tech platforms, they'll monopolize onto marketplaces, and everything will consolidate down into a few core marketplaces. Do you think there's any validity in that whatsoever? Um, Giuseppe's. That's my answer. Giuseppe's. There's Olive Gardens everywhere, but I go to Giuseppe's. Why? Because Olive Garden doesn't compare even close to Giuseppe's. What will happen in those marketplaces, they'll never get to the level of service of a Giuseppe's. Giuseppe's food is divine. Like that guy, he's so coming for sure. It is Italian food is so good. It, and I make Italian food. He makes it much better. I love Giuseppe because I never go to Olive Garden. That's a marketplace. That one's not. That's the way I look at it. Will that happen? There's probably going to be some consolidation, but I also think that there's already the rumblings of antitrust coming um, because they have extreme market power 
and it's and they can prove a case that it's injuring merchants. Um, they, I mean, they can prove that. Well, I mean, even my wife has told me that her company they forgot to respond to a customer service thing for like twenty four hours. Uh, it got lost somewhere in there, and they got shut down. It was like twenty thousand dollars a day. It, you, they can hurt you very quickly, uh, and so I think they should be very mindful of that because that is really easily a case of antitrust. You're like, well, it's good for the consumer. Like, yeah, but you're hurting the merchant too. And so that's where your kind of anti-competitive practice. So I have to watch out. Um, do I believe there's more of these coming? Yeah, probably. But I don't think people will get as much utility from them. I think, I actually think Amazon has peaked. Uh, I think they're kind of where they're at. Um, Amazon Prime will continue to go in price until people stop spending money on it. Um, and it's weird because now you have like movies and stuff. It's weird what everything sits. A to Z, right? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I think there'll be more marketplaces. I just, um, I think people will just get tired of it. And I don't think that they necessarily see the best services from them. Um, it's kind of like big box retail, right? All the big box retailers are struggling. And then uh, I think big box e-commerce will struggle as well at some point. They're struggling right now with the shipping because uh, it's not free and they know it's not free. It's never been free. And the cost for it has gone up and that will continue to go up. So we'll see. It's a yeah, place to be, but no, I think I still think individuals will have their stores. I, I, I mean, I look for those places. I don't, I don't for big box. I can avoid it. I prefer the smaller places. I get better service. I get people. <laughs> right, you get people. Yeah, yeah. market people. So, I, come on, I would agree as well. Which do you, do you yeah. go to a nice Italian restaurant? Or you go to a chain. Tell me the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And I think that's one. I think a lot of people are there. I think they're convenient at times. And I think at other times they're irritating. I guess for me, it's like, if I wanted to find replacements for this, it'll take me like three or four days to get it. I can just walk over to a store, pick them up now. So I'm going to get them now. Cause I need them now. Cause I don't plan ahead for a replacement in my pen. So, um, yeah. Interesting space. Yeah. Switching gears a little bit. Um, the purpose of the podcast is to inform e-com owners on ideally how to scale from seven to eight figures do you have any feedback for those brands what do you believe holds a seven figure brand back from becoming an eight figure brand information uh and what you're doing with the information um i know 20 30 million dollar brands that don't have databases to figure out what's going on there you're relying too much on a tech stack that is a point click drag drop you don't um they're good they're not that good I have yet to meet a single tech platform that could build the customer portfolio management as we report it today. And when I show it to people, they're just like, wow, in one page, you can see value creation, value loss um, on your platform uh, across your portfolios in one place. You just look at it and go, you're doing well here, not doing well here, you lost here. Oh, by the way, this was $30 million walked out your door last year. They're like, what? Like the top tier customers are gone. Um, and so when you see those things, it's shocking and stunning, but it's also, I could do something with it without that level of business intelligence, you're not going to be able to get much further because the other ones have it and they're really good at it. Really good at it. I mean, I've seen targets. Yeah. I can't this. You get, um, Walmart has gotten much better. Amazon is the king of that. They have massive data warehouses. They're very good at targeting customers. Um, and they're using machine learning now. So you're going to do it by hand. Their machines are going to do it. Now we're going to help retailers as part of our platform is to do something that work for them, um, to help them specifically to acquire and retain customers. But yeah, that if without that, I don't think they're going to make that leap. So there's interesting. There's inflection points too. We saw, you used to see this in retail where you would see a retailer get to about $700 million and then they just stopped growing and they'd stop for like five years. And you're like, to get to that billion dollar mark, what we figured it out was there were uh, 1,100 Class A malls in the United States, and they were in all of them. And in order to get to the building, they had to get above that. Uh, and that's what we are like, oh. So, you know, don't necessarily have that on the e-commerce. It's more about data and information and your ability to segment and target, push good audiences in Facebook and Google, and segment and target those folks. Um, yeah. If you don't have that, you'll be at a big disadvantage. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. This guy, it's just... I mean, it's, it's, yeah, the things that, that we could pop out 
you know, we did talk about category indexing, you know, how do customers index in different categories? So you can figure out who's going to be a good customer based on what category they enter on. You know, my throughout your product category is jeans and you came in and bought, you know, full price jeans, you're going to be around for a while because everybody loves our jeans. I, I can figure those things out. Um, and so that, that's where the, the business intelligence really comes in. And it's to me, if you're an agency, you would look at adding that in there. What you can do with some of the tools today, um, particularly that there are platforms that are API platforms. So you could say, connect to this one platform and you can connect your Shopify, Google Analytics, Clavio, merge it all over to BigQuery and we can start running business intelligence within a week and up and running. And it looks much better than what GA4 has. Um, and you can really mine down into information. I, I don't know why people, are, I guess they just don't know that they can do it. Um, but to me, that's the, that's the big benefit of those tools is that you can connect and move that data pretty quickly. Um, and you yeah. Help, yeah. yeah, you you need a, a data component now in, in paid acquisition because or else how are you informing the decisions that you're making? You do, it's, it's difficult, it's getting expensive. And, and it's, and, and, I mean, they would throw this out there like, Direct mail is almost cheaper. <laughs> it's like almost cheaper to acquire with direct mail than this than this. And and you just like, how did we get there again? So um, it's weird to see the cycle come through. But you think about those channels and how you can communicate it. Because for me, like my mailbox is empty. I don't get hardly anything. So when I get an offer, I usually see it and read it. I'm like, oh, nice. Um, and so yeah, uh, when you go where the customers are is what we tell them. But uh, you got to have the data to do it, and a lot of them don't. And then it's, it's not, it's not tremendously expensive either. If you think about it, it's not even an FTE, uh, at that, at that level of sales, it's not even, you might want to hire somebody, but you might use an agency and have an agency add that on as their service to say, we'll sync all your data over here and do advanced analytics, segmentation, targeting, better offers. If you want contribution margin, you can focus on contribution margin. Um, you can do whatever you want. So you got to have all that information. That's, that's kind of the goal. So. And I think most of these companies yeah. too at, at, in this space are probably QuickBooks at this th time. A QuickBooks reporting still isn't that good. No, nobody has good reporting. You're really going to kind of have to write that code by hand, which uh, you know some will use um, Power BI and those other tools that are out there, but they they lack one step in them that that you can do when you write SQL. Most people learn SQL in like 30, 60 days. It doesn't take long at all. It's very simple. Um, but what you have, yep. it applies and it, it's a good tool to have. Yeah. What do you think e-com business owners are going to be talking about this time next year? This time next year? What a crappy year 2024 was. <laughs> <And> <laughs> 23 was rough in the second half because it, you know, I saw the Shopify notes and I was like, yay, Shopify. And I'm like, I'm telling you that was the top 500 retailers that made that money. Almost everybody else lost. And cause I talked to a ton of retailers and they're like, no, we're down, we're way down. And it's like, uh, holidays, we like almost broke even. We were close. And it's like, okay. I mean, and, and that was the biggest selling time of the year. So if you're out there and you're like, my sales are in the toilet, you are not alone. There's a lot of people in the same boat. Um, a lot of change in that SEO piece really blew people up. Some changes in, in targeting and now continuing to blow that up on top of constrained consumer spending that doesn't look like it's going to relax anytime soon, 2024 is going to be a tough year. And so you're going to be sitting in an inventory position going, how do I get rid of this? Um, and that'll be the, the impetus will be, I need to do those huge discounts. Just don't go below your cogs. That's all I can tell you. Don't look at below cogs. At that point in time, you might as well just throw the stuff away. Um, you know, don't blow your, but there's going to be a lot of people stuck with it. I think 2024 will be a difficult year. Um, I'd love to see it get better, but I don't see that down the road with things that are going on right now. And in particular in the U S it's the driver of most of consumerism. So, um, and overseas it's worse in some places. So, and, and I think, I think they'll start getting accustomed to the new digital reality of privacy. And one of the things that I've been sort of tooling around is will more merchants get their discounts. And the only way you can get the discounts is if you register and sign it. And you know what? They're like, oh, no, no, that makes people go away. I'm like, Amazon makes you sign in to use Amazon Prime. So is it that bad? 
No, I'm not sure it is. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about what might happen to pull people that you know are going to stick with you. Um, but the cost of acquisition is going to go up. That's going to be tricky and hard to manage. So yeah, it's a, it's going to be, a, I think it's going to be a rough year, <laughs> but you know, 2025, I think should be a much better year. I think the interest rates and stuff will, do, will drop in the second half of the year. Um, yeah. And that should loosen things up a little bit. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll appreciate it, Chris. I'll say slightly, right? <laughs> Yeah, I know. T- tough end of the podcast, but... I had a better, um, had a better answer for you, but... <laughs> <laughs> I want to be real. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's that's fair enough. I, th- I think it just means that the the truly foundationally strong businesses will get through the other side and will always see the redistribution of demand towards them. And then all of the shaky businesses that really shouldn't be around... They don't have their margins right. They don't have a strong acquisition strategy. They don't have all the pieces of the puzzle that creates a strong retail or online brand. Yeah. They're the ones that unfortunately will end up suffering um, yeah. in 2024. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And then I think, and to the point of, you know, going from seven to eight figures, if you can't put that business intelligence piece in place to do the things that you need to do to start like, target people more efficiently, um, you'll find that the tools to do that are fairly expensive. But SQL is free. <laughs> so you can write that if you learn to do that. It's not a bad skill to add. Um, or find something you can do it. You can find a contract, I'm sure, that can write SQL for you um, on BigQuery until it blew the face. But I think those things will help you navigate the difficulty here um, where you can be more efficient with your marketing stand. You can be more efficient with your offers uh, and drive incremental units, not sending out, take 50% off, 40% off. Oh my God, the sky is on fire. You can't, you can't do that. If you do that, you're not. You're going to squat. You're going to slip down there and just go, I put myself in a bad place. Because it's not clear where that change will come. We know it's coming in the our economy. We just aren't quite sure um, when uh, and whether or not it would be a big enough boost to get people to really loosen up their wallets. Right now, people are just struggling a little bit with and the inflation here. It's not that it's our inflation is not high. It's just the prices from inflation are locked in and they're not going down. So now it's pinching people. So yeah. Yeah. It's tricky. It's a, it's a tricky time to be a retailer, but you know, opening, I mean, I know a retailer that's opening stores. They were all online for a long time. They did catalogs and now they're opening stores. They open stores, people are flocking to them. And they're like, so bricks and mortar seems to be doing okay in some places. So uh, it just depends. And that, for me, the smaller brands too, the uniqueness of your small brand is a good reason to have a store. Uh, people will come to that and they'll get up and just to get out of the house and, and come see what you've got. So think about that. Yeah, I think it probably reinforces the importance that online D2C is just a channel and it probably shouldn't be the foundation of the entire business and diversifying into retail is having some other channel, as you said, even white labeling products into other online stores. It's going to diversify risk, particularly in a absolutely I mean, shaky market. You can move large volumes. Of- I mean, and I don't know if people know that most... Most of those generic brands, let's say manufacturers, it's not like Kroger created a bunch of manufacturers. They didn't. Those are all coming from the same people. That's what white labeling is. Uh, you know, let's say manufacturers, they're just using different names. Uh, I think I figured that out when I, I toured with Hager down in Dallas. They were a client of ours. And I was like, how did you guys get around? And they told us a story from World War One. Well, they manufactured for like all the luxury brands were being manufactured by Hager because Hager during World War One and Two. I'd created manufacturing all across the world to support US troops. And I was like, I'll be darned. So when they told me all the brands that they did, I was like, huh, okay. So you go the same way. We make the same stuff. So yeah. So that's that's a it's another way to to think about your products and how can you, if you have, you know, custom products that you manufacture, how can you make more money out of it? And white labeling is certainly private labeling is certainly a, a way to go. Uh it's it's worth inspecting if you haven't done it before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Chris. Chris, I appreciate it. Um, I've learned a lot from you over the course of the last few months, but I think I've learned a lot from this conversation as well, and particularly the importance of relating database marketing to online I, first-party data. I hated being Debbie Downer at the very end. That was <laughs> sorry about that. I wish I could give you a better name for it. I'm, I'm trying to. <laughs> there's a silver lining in here somewhere. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what it is. Uh, but yeah, I think there was. 
I, I do think the more you don't be afraid of the data to be more data driven with that and focus on consumers. Um, someone asked me about this. I don't remember if it was you or not. Somebody was asking me, how would you do it? I'm like, take everything in your P&L and make it by consumer. Every single metric you have in your P&L and then change it per consumer and you'll look at your business in a different way. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's a good line to end all for me. So, best of luck, everybody. 2024 is rolling. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. All right, you take care. We'll talk to you soon.